welcome. Thank you for joining us today for a special virtual edition of our Dean's Lunch and Learn series featuring the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. My name is Megan Orr and I am the event director for the college and my role for today's webinar is to moderate the chat as well as facilitate the Q&A. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items. If you prefer to listen to today's webinar by phone, you can call in using the instructions on the screen. And those instructions are also in your email. If you have questions for either of the professors who are presenting today, please type them in the Q&A window accessed at the bottom of your screen. As time permits, Dean Kave and uh, Department Head Mats Heimdall will also address general questions at the end of our session. If you're having technical issues, please go ahead and type those into the chat feature, uh, the chat window at the bottom of your screen, and my colleague Andrea Hansen will assist you. And also we are recording today's webinar and we will share the link with all registrants following the event in the next day or so. And now I am pleased to in introduce Dean Moss Kabe. Moss Kabe has served as Dean of the University of Minnesota College of Science and Engineering since 2018 and has held various roles in the college for more than 40 years. Before serving as Dean, he served as Associate Dean for Research and Planning. And prior to that, he was head of the Department of Electrical uh, and Computer Engineering from 1990 to 2005. Dean Kabe joined the University of Minnesota uh, electrical, computer, and engineering faculty in 1975. Dean Kave, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. It is afternoon. Uh, yes. <laughs> Great to be uh, with you all. Thank you so much for joining us. These series of lunch and learns are happy occasions for us normally to get together with, with our alumni and other interested uh, community members to uh, talk about the college, um, about the college, uh, college's programs, uh, aspirations and plans, and then at the same time highlight one of our departments and some of the research that goes on in one of our departments. And of course, normally we have an opportunity to serve some lunch. Uh, and, and for you all who attend uh, these meetings, who have an opportunity to uh, uh, talk amongst yourselves, uh, build the community, um, enjoy the networking and everything. But these are very unusual times. And, um, and it is a situation that we have been facing for several months under the COVID pandemic, which, which has created uh, this, this uh, new format of meeting with you. And uh, it is a very unusual time for our community, certainly um, in, in facing a major tragedy and its aftermath. So if you don't mind, I'd like to just take a minute for all of us to reflect on not only the pandemic, which has affected so many around the world and certainly in our country and in our state, in our community, um, but also this inc un incomprehensible and tragic loss of life of one of the uh, members of our um, community, um, Mr. George Floyd. So please join me in a moment of silence and, and reflection as we uh, think about all who are affected so terribly by all of these uh, issues before we continue with our normal program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for uh, joining us. And um, I'd like to uh, get back to um, 
really uh, facing the situation under the pandemic that the uh, university has faced, just, just to give you a few updates about how things have progressed and where things are going, as, as I expect a number of you may have questions about these. Um, the university, just about the time of its uh, spring break, um, things evolved in the, uh, in, both in terms of directives from the uh, governor and, um, and the increase in the number of cases that were happening around the state that we joined many other and really eventually all the other uh, academic institutions as well as of course K through 12 and the businesses and, and all to uh, go into a remote um, operation. So our, our faculty, our students uh, had to do this incredible, incredible pivot in just a matter of days, really about uh, four or five days for, for the faculty to move all of their courses online and for students to be able to uh, manage their business, set up all of their systems, um, really get themselves back into the mode of um, learning to, uh, with, with, with the community in an online format. But we don't have a whole lot of time to, to talk about uh, these in detail. All I can tell you is that given the incredible challenge that our students and our faculty and staff and everybody had faced, things really progressed famously. So since, since about March 18th, when we fully and formally went online, um, the, the semester continued, the semester um, has completed. Uh, our students have, have received their degrees, those who, who, who were scheduled to receive their degrees, they have their grades and everything. And we're now getting ready for a um, summer session of online teaching, and then we'll plan for the uh, rest of the operations for next year like everybody else. So that's where we are in terms of uh, managing uh, within this um, pandemic, under the pan pandemic uh, restrictions and constraints that we're operating. We are beginning to, we actually have started as of two weeks ago, a very gradual opening of our research labs for for students and faculty who cannot work from home and have to be in a laboratory. And these are happening in a very, very careful and planned approach. So that's moving along. But, um, but the college, of course, is continuing its plans. The, the college, just to um, give some reminder for some of you, uh, is uh, over a year ago, really going on two years, uh, we, we made a plan uh, and Professor Hemdahl here was actually chair of a faculty committee that, that um, worked on a plan of, of action for the college. We, we knew the demand for our programs was enormous, um, both by the students and by employers at the time, and uh, we felt the responsibility to expand the college and admit more students. We did put that plan in place, and in the fall of 2019, in fact, uh, we overshot our plan. We had planned to uh, increase our incoming first year student population by 10% and we went over that. And so we had planned also to continue that expansion for fall of 2020. And, um, and with, with another about eight or 9% increase, and that remains to be seen because of the situation with the, with the pandemic. But that plan is in place, it's long-term, and we are putting everything um, in motion in terms of the infrastructure and so forth. Hopefully, that as we come out of this uh, particular challenge, that, that we will continue to uh, go in the, in the way that we, we wish to go, both in terms of uh, teaching uh, educating our students and, and also uh, in, in our collaborations with the outside community, with research and everything else. So that, that's the sort of a, sh a short part of the plan. Part of this has involved uh, significant communication and engagement with our alumni and supporters because your support is so incredibly uh, important to everything that we do both financially and, and in terms of the general support, uh, even if it is to uh, communicate with our legislative uh, um, uh, 
community that will, uh, uh, legislators who have to, for example, decide on some building plans that we have put in, in place in the, at the, at the uh, state level. Um, we have, um, the, as, as you can imagine, a lot of our students have faced uh, major challenges under this pandemic. That, that even goes uh, down to the basic necessities, everything from food and rent and uh, everything else uh, or, or access to technology so that they can use the online systems as well as us as a college trying to put together um, uh, more capabilities for us to deliver the, uh, the distance and alternative education to our students and to be able to help with those both to help our students and help the initiatives in the college to, for, for these new schemes for us and new uh, facilities that, that, and, and systems that we're going to develop. For the students, we have established a particular fund. It's a challenge fund that was started by the, the leaders of our Dean's Advisory Board and our campaign committee in the college. It's called a CSE Response Fund that you may have uh, uh, heard about and so we that we were extremely extremely grateful for all of you who have contributed to that particular fund because it means so much and it will impact so many of our students and and our programs at this very very uh, difficult time um so let me uh essentially wrap up at this point because you're here to uh hear from uh, our colleagues in computer science and engineering this is a very special year for, for the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and you will hear more about that for, from um, our department head, Mats Heimdall. It is the, um, it's the department's 50th Jubilee anniversary. It, it's, it's a 50 years of incredible, incredible accomplishments, incredible contributions to, to the education of students, to uh, impactful research, and as we will hear as just one example of that, even in terms of um, startups and commercialization, really incredible uh, impact. So I'm joining you, looking forward to hear from Mats and our two colleagues who are here to talk about their research shortly. So Mats Hem Hemdahl, the, our distinguished head of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Take it away, Mats. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll do my best and I'll keep this short because I'm sure you're not all that interested in hearing me droning on about things. Um, but I'm Mats Heimdall. I'm the head of the Department of Computer Science. I've been the head the last five years. And uh, this year, oh, first I want to thank everybody for coming. And uh, this year, I'm going to share my screen here if I can figure that out. Uh, that one, no, I want to share PowerPoint slideshow, share. There, did that work? And I can change slides. Yes, so no, the, the, as most mentioned, we, we're 50 years old and that kind of snuck up on us. It tends to do that. I'm sure some of you can relate. The, um, over the last five decades, we've really grown the department from a small, a uh, group of visionary uh, numerical analysts, really. Uh, Moss and I had a discussion about this. The department really grew out of numerical analysts and mathematicians. I gave a talk about the birth of the computing industry in, uh, in Minnesota, and it doesn't matter I, how much it pains me, but that really grew out of electrical and computer engineering. Um, but the department was really started by a, a very pioneering group of numerical analysts and uh, high performance computing users. And now it's grown to something much, much bigger. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. And some of you I know were at our 50th anniversary celebration that we had in November. And uh, we're planning to have one later in the fall, but given the current situation, we might have to push that into spring or do that somehow uh, online. But this is the year for us to celebrate uh, 50 years of computing in at the University of Minnesota. So the state of the department, it's, uh, we're doing very well. We have an outstanding faculty. We're 46 uh, tenured and tenure track faculty right now. And we have 14 outstanding teaching faculty that uh, 
that really has elevated the teaching of a lot of our courses to a completely new level. So we're eternally grateful that they are working with us. We have uh, very large undergraduate programs now. We're the second biggest major at the university. Only psychology is bigger. We have about 1,200 majors and uh, we have graduated well over um, 400 students. We have close to 500 grad students working with us. So it's starting to be a, a very large operation. And uh, we are expanding our programs or collaborating with other departments to expand our programs. So we're launching a Bachelor of Science in Data Science program this fall, uh, primarily together with, the, with uh, statistics, but also with involvement from ECE and Industrial Systems Engineering and a lot of other programs that do extensive data analytics and data science. Uh, there is a program, Master of Science in Robotics, launching this uh, fall that's been started primarily through our new uh, robotics institute the college's new uh, minri minnesota robotics institute and uh, that program has been put together with computer science and uh, mechanical engineering aerospace electrical and so on so there's a lot of interesting things happening on the educational front the students we produce, they get sucked up by industry or at least they were we'll see what happens now but 10 weeks ago we pretty much had 0% unemployment of our students. They were all gainfully employed uh, three months after graduation. And they had the highest average starting salary of all graduates from, from the college. So computer science and computing students are in extremely high demand. Uh, we are also seeing a lot of demand from around the university in terms of our courses. In our intro courses, uh, well more than half are uh, from outside computer science taking the courses because the students want to learn about computing. And that has led us to be the actually the biggest department uh, at the university in terms of delivering credit hours. Uh, we're delivering more credit hours than the math department and the students have to take the math courses. They want to take our courses. So that has put an enormous amount of pressure on our faculty uh, to deliver all these courses and our students to serve as uh, TAs. And of course, uh, we're doing well with our research. We're highly active. Uh, our research expenditures were more than $12 million last year. Uh, so the faculty is extremely successful at, at uh, what they're doing. So moving forward, there are challenges for us or opportunities, depending on how you see it. But one of the biggest one is we need to deal with the growth. I mentioned we have a lot of students. Um, we need to grow our faculty to accommodate that. We need to grow our graduate student population so they can be teaching assistants. And um, we need more space because we're starting to really burst at the seams. Now, luckily, there are projects going on. The college has been very supportive. And uh, thank you very much, Dean Cave, for supporting us. Uh, so there are plans of renovating Lind Hall that will uh, relieve some of this pressure. And then in the future, renovate Shepherd Labs that will help relieve more pressures. I'm really looking forward to those projects. We want to provide support for all our students, especially now in these uh, trying times. The undergrads are in great need of support because they might have lost their jobs, uh, their parents might have lost their jobs, so we're working on uh, scholarships and other things to support that. Same thing with the graduate students. Without top-notch graduate students, we can't have a top-notch graduate uh, or research program. So supporting and finding, uh, helping these students out is of great importance. And there are things that's complicating our lives. For example, right now we're not expecting any international students to show up this fall because of visa restrictions, which is one issue that, uh, that could really wreak havoc on the research enterprise for uh, US universities and then really for US companies. So that's one thing we're keeping a close eye on that uh, greatly worries us really that if, uh, if we can't import the best students, they're going to be a real problem uh, moving forward. Then uh, we want to hire more faculty. As I said, that's one way of dealing with the growth. Uh, we were doing valiant efforts to hire a lot of faculty this year. Thank you very much, Dean Cave. Unfortunately, we had a little uh, pandemic incident and that put a lot of problems in terms of the hiring. Uh, we succeeded in hiring one faculty member, Dr. Stevie Chancellor. She will be joining us in the fall of 2021, but we were really aiming to hire five to eight faculty this year. And uh, that, that just didn't happen, unfortunately. So hopefully we will get an opportunity to do that in the, in the coming years. 
And finally, one thing that is a um, high priority of mine is broadening participation in computing. This is something that we need in terms of our research, uh, teaching, and out in industry. There are really just not enough women and underrepresented minorities involved in computing. And as we all know, if you don't have diversity in your teams, things are just not working all that well. And we've seen that with some of the missteps in the computing industry. So this is uh, something where we're really aiming to provide support uh, in a nurturing environment to help broaden computing. So it's not primarily uh, men and uh, primarily white men in this in this field so we need to bring up our uh, the number of females for example we've done a good job brought it up to, doubled the percentage of women in the in computing but when you look at the sheer numbers that was taking it from nine percent women in computing or in computer science to 18 percent which is huge strides forward but still sadly underrepresented so that's something that we're going to be working on but now I've taken up uh, way too much time already, so I want to move on and uh, introduce two of our, our spectacularly bright faculty. Professor Volkan Ischler, he's been with us uh, since 2008, and he's working in robotics, and primarily uh, his best known work, I think, is in agricultural applications of uh, robotics. And he will be talking about some of his work in how you can collect data and do other things with uh, autonomous and computer vision vehicles. Then we have assistant professor Stephen Wu. He joined us much more recently. So he's a newbie. He came here in 2018. And his uh, main focus is on uh, machine learning and in particular how these machine learning systems might not behave exactly the way we expect them to or want them to. For example, they might have privacy issues. There are fairness issues, bias issues. So he's looking at how we can avoid and detect those kinds of problems uh, when applying these kinds of uh, these kinds of technologies. So uh, I'm just going to hand off to uh, Volkan and uh, get, take myself off. So thank you very much for for being here, and uh, I'm looking forward to interacting with most of you or all of you in the future. Thank you, Mats. And while Vulcan is doing his screen share, just a quick reminder that you can go ahead and uh, type any questions that you have into the Q&A section. Um, the Q&A button is at the bottom of your screen. And after Vulcan's presentation, I will uh, read whatever questions you, submit, you have submitted for him. Thank you. Um, just a second, sorry. Um, is my screen showing up uh, all right? Cool. So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Volker Nischler. I'm in the computer science and engineering department. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is uh, squeeze about a decade worth of research into uh, 10 minutes. So I'll be going at the speed of like one year per minute. Um, but so in terms of the overall vision, what I've been working on for a lot of my research is um, in a way what I call Googling the planet. So what we would like to be able to do is just like, you know, we can go online and search for things on the, on the internet. Just imagine that you could also query you know, the physical world and answer questions like these ones. So you could say, if you're a farmer, hey, give me the nitrogen distribution over my farm, or, you know, track the change of crop height. Um, if you're interested in the environment, imagine you could track all the moose in uh, northern Minnesota, um, you know, or go even, you know, at details, uh, find defective apples on your trees and count strawberries and things like that. So if you look at these, uh, these types of queries, they are very difficult to answer because um, you need to be able to extract very fine scale information in very large environments. So a farm can be you know, thousands of acres and you're talking about just counting apples and things like that. Um, and the other thing that's interesting here is the information is not just uh, you know, geometric or pixels and colors, but there's a lot of semantic information. So when you say, find me the moose, like you need to be able to find you know, the animals or the, the, the plants and, and things like that. So 
So to be to make this a reality, what we've been working on is to use robots uh, as kind of autonomous sensing devices to that are capable of collecting this 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 type of information. Um, so as much mentioned, I joined the department in uh, 2008, and at that time, uh, you know, from day one, we started you know going outdoors doing these experiments, and this is a system for data collection that we started out with. And as you see, it is, uh, it is actually a toy car uh, that we program to collect uh, information from wireless devices. And this project actually evolved into a big environmental monitoring project. Um, so what you see here is we built a system for um, detecting carp. So what you do is, let's say this is Lake Phelan, I think. You want to detect carp, you say, hey, go cover these areas and the boats here go out and autonomously find the, find the fish. Um, and we were able to cover um, 10 years ago, you know, miles and miles of area uh, distances on, on lakes with these autonomous boats. Um, so in this, in this particular application, the, um, the fish are radio tagged. So we find them actually by listening to the signal on, on them. Um, and here's an example where we actually use uh, multiple robots, which can, you know, collect these measurements. Um, you see the directional antenna that's rotating and then robots uh, communicate with each other and share in information um, to find the fish as quickly as, as possible. Um, and of course, this is Minnesota and we want to do uh, tracking year around. And the, the system also has been developed for, you know, going on, on frozen lakes in, in the winter. Um, so a lot of this is, you know, all hard work and sweat and sometimes even blood of my students. And this, this decade I, I mentioned corresponds to roughly like two generations of students. So the first generation, uh, this is Pratap Tokekar, who is now a professor at University of Maryland. And the other one is Josh Vanderhoek, who uh, is now at JPL. He just recently got promoted and he's literally doing this, but in space now. Um, and another contributor to this project was Nargis Nuri. So Nargis worked on uh, search problems and she is now at Google. So within you know, this one project, we were able to generate three amazing students, you know, both in academia, government labs and, and, and industry. Um, so this research then uh, evolved into kind of UAVs and um, a similar task, but this time for actually uh, tracking moose. Um, so this is an example of a three robot system which maintains formation and uh, tries to find them. <clears throat> this is, this work, uh, can you hear the background or um, I'll just pause this. So this work then evolved into uh, agriculture uh, and we've been doing a lot of work on different types of crops, but uh, the one that's in most advanced stages in apple orchards. So we started doing this um, around the 2014 uh, in collaboration with uh, James Luby in Horticultural Sciences Department. Uh, Jim is the co-inventor of Honeycrisp. So we're already we have a very strong program in here. But our goal was you know, for farmers to be able to go with various types of vehicles or maybe even on foot and then collect data. Um, and with this collected data, we can actually extract. So this is the apples um, in this case we can very robustly track them and estimate the size of the apples. Um, and this research uh, has you know, evolved to the point that now we have a you know, startup, Farm Vision Technologies, um, University of Minnesota startup, which can actually do this in, at commercial scales. So I'll show you some examples of what they're capable of. Oh, before that, so this is Patrick. Um, Patrick joined my lab uh, as an undergrad um, and he recently graduated and he took the helms of Farm Vision. Um, so he's the CEO uh, and here's what they can do. So with a handheld system, you can just go into a farm, collect the number of uh, fruit and their sizes and then develop a heat map like this. So even before harvest, the farmers can know exactly how many, how many fruit they have and plan, plan accordingly. Um, so this is kind of the second generation that I mentioned. Um, this is Wambo who worked on uh, estimating tree morphology and the volume. So Wambo also graduated and he'll be joining, joining 3M. Um, 
Provacar uh, on the left is the kind of main Apple detection guy. And he recently finished and uh, joined the Microsoft research. Um, and Nicolas on the right is just about to wrap up and he has the pleasure of being on the job market in this uh, crazy, crazy climate. Um, but I just wanted to put this and you should know that farming, I mean, you probably know farming is a back breaking uh, job, but even for research, it is, it is not different. So it is all of hard work on, on my students uh, behalf. Now, just in a few slides, uh, what we're working on is to go beyond monitoring and you know actively manage the farms. And I'll give you two examples of this. This is a work uh, in collaboration with the uh, Norwegian University of Life, Life Sciences with uh, Johan Prom. So they have this uh, platform for strawberry, um, strawberry farms. Um, and we work together to develop a harvester. So we mainly did the vision part of it, but this is the system in action. So we're going beyond the uh, monitoring to picking in this case. And this robot uh, designed mainly for these like tabletop systems can actually go and pick the fruit. And then uh, an on another ongoing project, uh, this is state funded and it is joined with UFM Morris and Toro is to um, mow pastures for these cows. So what we're doing is uh, we retrofitted one of the Toro vehicles. So that's Toro's part. And my lab is building the sort of navigation component that's Mihan in the picture, who you may have seen this uh, article in Star Tribune, but I just wanted to show you the system in action. So this, this summer we were hoping to go and start the field uh, tests, but eventually this robot will go autonomously and move the, mow the, mow the lawns. So, so I'm kind of getting the end of my presentation, but I just want to have like two takeaways. One is I'm gonna show these like cool videos of robots and so on, but a lot of our research, I mean, all of this wouldn't be happening without fundamental research. And I can claim that you know, even for industry these days, without the fundamental research going on at universities, they wouldn't be able to make a lot of progress. Um, and then the other thing is I wanted to reiterate, this is all about people. And in particular, in my case, my students who, you know, put their hearts into it and they're going through very difficult times dealing with, you know, COVID-19, the visa situations, health situations. Um, so thank you all for your support of our university and department. Um, and I also wanted to mention, in addition to sort of our current students, the future University of Minnesota students, it's going to be a very different world for them. So I think it's very important to train them with, you know, robotics, computer vision, sensing the tech that they will be living with in their lives. Um, so, and the final note, like in my case, there's a lot of activity in robotics, but if we really wanted to do these things in, you know, commercial, I'll just show you two pieces. So the top left is what strawberry tunnels look like in commercial scale. The bottom is uh, apple orchards. So being, even to record images at this scale is a big challenge. So that requires a lot of fundamental research. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks uh, to our sponsors. And I also wanted to finish by thanking Dean Kawe for, you know, he's been very supportive of robotics since the day I joined here. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Vulcan. And we do have a few minutes for questions for you still. Um, the first question that I am seeing is, uh, from Darren and he is wondering if you can use your database to determine the optimal amount of fertilizer, pesticides, and water to use on crops. Um, hopefully, <laughs> um, I mean, this is, a, this is the goal eventually, but there's a lot more. So we're kind of like the front end of it. We want to collect both the raw information and turn it into what people call actionable information. But working with my colleagues in, you know, agriculture and horticulture, these are very complex decisions that are very sort of, you know, locality specific. So I, I think this will be happening, but uh, I think it is still, it requires a lot of work. So I cannot say we can do it now, but I'm hopeful that we will be able to do it soon. 
Wonderful, thank you. And uh, please do keep typing in your questions about uh, Vulcan, Vulcan's presentation. Um, we have a more general question about research activities at the university and in the college in general, which I'm gonna hold until the end for Dean Cave to answer. Um, but um, Vulcan, have you thought about testing your technology in developing countries like Indonesia with big agricultural base economy? Um, yes and no. I mean, for certain crops, uh, I think there's a lot of potential. Um, every country has its own sort of unique challenges. Um, and in particular, um, in the US, I think agriculture is much more industrialized and there's more emphasis on, on uniformity, quality than other countries. Um, so, and it's, you know, we're here, so we started here, but eventually we're hoping that um, for like apples, for example, the harvest in the US is around September, October. Uh, but if we could go to, you know, the Southern hemisphere, we would get like two harvests per year. So that's the first on our agenda. Um, and then in Europe, for example, where labor is a big issue, um, there's a lot of emphasis on, you've seen the strawberry tabletop uh, setups that I, I showed. So those also make it easier for automation. So I think that's gonna be another another frontier. Um, and and for sure, you know, in, in, in other countries, people are, are thinking about these, these problems uh, as well. So we hope so. Wonderful, a lot of great questions coming in now. Um, the next one is, can this be used to help predict California wildfire risks? Um, risks, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very specific question. And, uh, and I don't know if the issue there is establishing the risks or, um, I actually was there in one of the fires uh, two years ago. And I think the, the thing is like to, to spot when it first uh, starts, because after a while there's nothing they can do to stop it. They literally try to control it. And I'm sure there are already, already monitoring systems in place. I know people like try to use drones and so on, but I also heard that they usually get in the way of like firefighters. Um, so maybe I can say like, this is an active research area, um, but I don't know where the solution is, whether it's gonna be fixed sensors or satellite imagery or low flying satellites or, you know, routine reconnaissance missions. Uh, but this is for sure something that, you know, I will be interested in working on. All right, a couple more. Um, Stephen is wondering um, what portion of agricultural robotic research uh, is using ground robotics versus aerial robotics? Um, so, so for row crops, um, especially, you know, corn, soy, we, there's already a lot of automation. You can actually buy, you know, these are not necessarily reactive, they're often pre-programmed systems. Um, so if that counts as a ground robot, then I would say that dominates. Uh, but in terms of the so-called like intelligent robotics, when this first came out, I think most of the activity was um, on using drones. Um, I also did quite a bit of work there. Um, but I, I feel like in agriculture, now that I'm more familiar with the industry, if you look at the major sort of costs, it revolves around labor, fertilizer usage, pesticide, you know, application, harvesting, um, and each of these at some point will require interaction with the crops. So I'm, and these are hard to do with drones. So I'm guessing um, it will be more and more ground-based. And then I want to take one more question and then um, Stephen will go ahead and switch over to you. Stephen, why don't you go ahead and start sharing your screen um, if possible. Um, Vulcan, the last question for you is agricultural practices in the Midwest are based upon large equipment across acres. Do you foresee a small bot revolution to allow for micromanaged farms? Um, yeah, this is a great question. And in a way, this is why I also got interested in um, horticulture more than row crops. Because as I mentioned in row crops, there's a lot of automation with like big vehicles and, and so on, but nothing, almost nothing for 
you know, orchards. So apple is the biggest one, but same for berries and, and, and things like that. Um, and greenhouses are also becoming more and more common. Um, so I think the answer is going to be yes, for sure, for these industries. I don't know if a similar thing will happen for row crops. I mean, given the size of, you know, the, the, these farms, I, I doubt small robots will scale for corn, let's say. But I know people are also interested in doing things like, you know, seeding, fertilizer application, and those, for example, once the crop is high, you cannot like drive over them with a big vehicle. So I think for those applications, we'll see a lot of small robots. Uh, and in fact, there's actually a Minnesota-based company who, who is focused on directly on it. It's called Robot, and I think they're still around. So. Cool. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, so Stephen, the mic is, mic is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers for this wonderful event. It's really great to be able to connect with many of you in this difficult time. And I also want to thank Mats for the gracious introduction. So it's always hard to give a presentation after a senior star robotics faculty who has dazzling pictures and videos. So uh, I'm not gonna have much of that, uh, but I would like to maybe highlight perhaps a different sort of impact uh, computer science or algorithms may have on society. Um, so machine learning uh, has seen amazing success for the past two decades. Uh, machine learning now permeates different aspects of our society. Algorithms now have access to incredibly detailed information about us, our movements, our interests, our browsing history, and all kinds of sensitive information. So algorithms often take these personal data as input and eventually inform or make decisions on people. So there are concerns that when these algorithms so heavily rely on our private information, um, they might compromise our privacy. And when these algorithms are informing or making decisions about people, there are concerns that uh, these algorithms may have unfair biases or unfair discrimination against certain populations. So uh, the research in our group uh, is really trying to address this emerging tension between algorithms and society. And at a high level, there's a central question that drives our overall research agenda. So we'd like to think about how we can make machine learning methods better aligned with certain important societal values. For example, how do we protect people's privacy? Or how do we prevent unfair discrimination when the algorithms are making or informing decisions on people? So, uh, so this talk is gonna be short, so I'm, I'm just gonna maybe briefly talk about some of my recent work in, in those two areas, privacy and fairness. Um, so I'm gonna start with the topic of privacy. Uh, if you look at both literatures of privacy and fairness, uh, I would say that privacy is slightly more mature than fairness by roughly a decade of literature. So here we actually know uh, what sort of definition of privacy we should aim for and what sort of trade-off you might have for privacy and the utility of data analysis. So um, the main framework I've been thinking about in my research is this framework called differential privacy. Uh, in general, it's a formal and rigorous way to provide privacy preserving data analysis. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about the formal definition or the mathematics behind it, but for simplicity, think about there's some sensitive data set uh, that might contain some individual medical records. And what we would like to do is to design some kind of algorithm that get to release some sort of statistical information about the data set as a whole, but not necessarily about individual data record. So differential privacy, what it really means is just a sort of stability notion, uh, okay? So, you know, if you think about changing a single data record in the input data set, say Alice data, by Bob's data, which might look completely different. Differential privacy just ensure that the output distribution uh, on noisy statistics, for example, are not changed by much. So there's a more formal and quantitative way to, to actually uh, define this. Um, so differential privacy has undergone well over a decade of intense theoretical study. Uh, by now, we know many, many algorithms for virtually all of the statistical and machine learning tasks. 
Uh, and more recently, there's actually lots of exciting de deployments uh, of differential privacy across many organizations. So most notably, the U.S. Census 2020 this year uh, is actually going to release some of the statistics uh, within this framework. And many organizations such as uh, Google, Microsoft, and Apple uh, also incorporating differential privacy in their data analysis. Um, so you might have seen the recent news of Google releasing some sort of uh, mobile location heat map uh, in relation to how we think about social distancing uh, in this COVID-19 crisis. So over time, more and more people have to actually work with differential privacy in their data analysis. But not everyone actually has the background or training uh, thinking about differential privacy. So one big challenge going forward to actually make these tools practical uh, is actually how we facilitate non-experts to work with this kind of framework. Uh, so some of our, our work in, in this area is to actually think about a diff slightly different approach. So instead of trying to release different sort of noisy statistics, uh, we're actually going to release what we call a synthetic data set. So literally it's just a data set that consists of fake data records. So each fake data record might look completely different from the original data record. But the synthetic data set as a whole preserves some of the important statistical properties you might care about. Uh, so the main advantage of that is you actually don't really limit the data scientist's freedom or flexibility in how they run their data analysis because they can interact with this synthetic data set freely without thinking about uh, further consequences of privacy because the, the synthetic data set already preserved this kind of privacy guarantee. So uh, we've been making progress in many domains. One domain that's specific, uh, especially interesting to us is the medical domain because many of the medical data sets actually cannot be shared for many privacy policy issues. Uh, so uh, alongside with many medical researchers at Penn and Harvard, we actually try to release one of the data set called Sprint uh, under this notion of differential privacy. And we, beyond medical domain, we're also thinking about how we can actually do that in other social science domain where the data set are also sensitive. Uh, for example, uh, data set related to uh, child maltreatment uh, hotline screening calls. Uh, so this is roughly what I'm going to talk about for uh, privacy. Uh, I'm going to leave some other points to questions. Uh, now I want to actually talk about the other topic, which is fairness, uh, specifically fairness in machine learning, when we are trying to build a learning model or prediction model uh, that inform, make decisions on people. So one question you might ask is, why would machine learning be unfair in any way, right? Uh, by automating many of this decision process or this, some of the data analysis tool, we are removing many of the human elements from this pipeline. So intuitively, you should think that this automation should also remove many of the biases coming from human. Another question is, well, if you are concerned about these kind of machine learning model being discriminatory against certain racial or gender groups, uh, why don't we just try the approach of fairness through blindness or unaware unawareness, just simply remove some of these demographic information such as race and gender from the predictive model so, so the model will by no means have a way to actually discriminate against these groups. So there are, there are, there are really layers of complexity around these simple, uh, seemingly simple questions. But uh, I would like to actually use a rather simple example to start, to maybe help you start thinking about some of these issues. By no means, this is like a, you know, an example to capture everything in reality, but somehow this is, uh, I find it useful in thinking about some of the basic issues. So, for the sake of argument, think about a hypothetical situation where an admission office come to us and say, we would like to build a model to predict college applicants' success uh, based on two simple features. Uh, here really is just the SAT score and their GPA. And there is really the so-called binary classification problem where there's each individual come with a label um, plus and minus. So these are individuals coming from their historical data. And let's say for the sake of argument, plus really means they, by some measurements, succeed in college 
and over the years actually make generous donations to the College of Science and Engineering. Um, so if you look at this green population, uh, if you want to build a simple line or linear classifier, so to speak, to predict their college success, uh, you probably will, will play or select a classifier that looks like a blue line, which will do pretty well. You tend to actually predict very well on most individuals. Well, now suppose there's actually not just the green population. Now I'm telling you there's actually a minority population, let's call it the orange population. Um, and overall, there's really a downward shift from the green population in the sense that their SAT scores tend to be lower. Uh, so this could really happen in particular when these uh, individuals in this population might come from uh, a background of lower socioeconomic status, and they might not be able to afford the same level of SAT preparation. Nevertheless, there's actually also a reasonable classifier that in this toy example actually give you perfect accuracy in predicting their, their college you know, success. Okay, so in reality, you actually put these people together in the same pool. Um, and somehow by some basic legal or regulatory restrictions, some of the admission process actually do not allow the explicit use of these demographic information such as race or gender in this process. Okay, so if you do that and you only care about the overall accuracy in predicting their success, you'll end up pretty much deploying the same classifier that's much more tailored to the majority green population. Um, however, if you actually think about the implication on the, the orange population, because of the downward shift on the SAT score, actually none of the qualified individuals will end up being admitted. Um, so in a way, we're actually being unfair to this green, uh, orange subpopulation because the qualified individuals are actually getting falsely rejected. So what is this toy example really telling us? Well, like the algorithm oftentimes will be set to optimize for a single objective, which is usually the overall accuracy. It doesn't really think about this some, of, some sort of fairness issues behind it. And we can't really just by heuristic, by thinking about removing some of these protected attributes like race and gender and which things just magically work out. So instead, I think a more reasonable approach in thinking about this problem is thinking about much more constrained optimization problem that explicitly captures some of these fairness criteria you might care about inside of the training or machine learning process. So usually take the form of maximizing predictive accuracy or some other form of utility subject to some kind of fairness criteria. So there are many examples in the literature in thinking about what fairness might mean. Uh, I want to remark that uh, none of this really comprehensively capture everything you might desire for fairness. Each one have their pros and cons and caveats and may not be universally applicable. But the advantage of thinking about this framework is, is you can actually explore these kind of fairness criteria consequences. In particular, you can think about if you want to impose one of these five fairness criteria, you can specify how tight or how constrained you want this fairness constraint to be and start to think about some of the you know, trade-off between utility such as accuracy and fairness. Um, so, what you can do is actually start thinking about some of these algorithms and deploy it across different domain uh, by recover what we call the Pareto frontier. So it's really a frontier that is optimal in terms of thinking about the trade-off between fairness and accuracy or unfairness versus error, if you like. So you could start running some of our algorithms in the literature, uh, in our work, and produce these kind of curves and Pareto frontiers if you want. But this is how far an algorithm can really get to you. Eventually, if you actually want to deploy in the real system, you need to actually select a predicted model or decision model from these curves, from these Pareto frontier. And this is not really an algorithm question because eventually it's really a social choice needed to make by stakeholders in different domains or even domain experts. So uh, 
outside of some of these algorithm work or machine learning work, uh, so there's actually an exciting intersection between machine learning and human computer in intersection interaction inside our department. So I have started working with uh, some of the students in the HCI or human computer interaction group, uh, including Lauren Chavin and Hai Zhu, along with uh, students Bowen and Irene. We've been thinking about how to actually start communicating some of these algorithm, algorithm trade-offs across different fairness criteria or fairness uh, or, or accuracy to stakeholders who may not have any of these formal algorithm or machine learning training, but they are the people who eventually need to make these decisions and deploy them in the wheel system. And eventually they need to you know, explore and understand these trade-offs and eventually express their preferences in selecting the model. There will be disagreement and there's further mechanism design question that's really going along this research agenda. So perhaps going beyond this picture, really there's lots of synergies between what we may call humans and algorithms. So in many of these systems, uh, decision-making system or decision support system, algorithm is really just a piece within a bigger socio-technical pipeline. So oftentimes algorithm provides some form of prediction or information and human get to make the final decisions. So we also been thinking about how to investigate some of these fairness issues along with some real system, such as the Allegheny County Department of Human Services, where they use predictive algorithm to assist the child maltreatment hotline screening. And also Wikimedia Foundation, where they use machine learning algorithms to assist their content quality control. So there are many questions we would like to explore here, such as how do we actually elicit the stakeholders in these domains? What are their values? Uh, and how do we actually embed some of their value inside the process of algorithm design that can further assist the human to make better decisions? And how do we elicit their, their values to actually manage some of these underlying fundamental trade-offs across perhaps fairness, privacy, and accuracy? So I'm going to stop here uh, and, you know, there are many more things I could say, but uh, I would like to invite some more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll try to get to one, maybe two questions before we wrap up. Um, we want to be mindful of people's lunch hours, if that is in fact what you're doing right now, if you're in our central time zone. Um, the first question is, will differential privacy finally open up HIPAA biometric databases to medical researchers rather than today's situation where HIPAA constraints enforce silos? Yeah, so that will be the, the dream goal in many ways. Um, so we're making progress to that. I wouldn't say that that will certainly happen, but I'm optimistic that could actually happen in certain sub area and domain where uh, the, 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 the problems are mobilized. For example, the data set will be larger, it'll be easier for differential privacy to work. I think perhaps uh, beyond this kind of technical issues, the bigger barrier beyond this is policy, right? So like, uh, how, how do you actually use differential privacy as an interesting uh, and useful privacy measure and actually enable the policy uh, to allow this kind of differentially private data sharing? Um, so I do think the technical solutions sort of go, go first, happen first, the policy uh, transformation tend to take place much later. But the the technical solution is always an optimistic way to start. All right, thank you so much. I hate to cut this Q&A short, but we are at time. Um, so um, I, I thank you all for all the wonderful questions that you submitted. Um, we'll try to perhaps um, answer some of them um, in the follow-up email. Otherwise, please feel free to email those questions if you'd still like them answered um, to csealumni at umn.edu. Again, that's csealumni at umn.edu, and we can pass them along to the professors. Um, I will say uh, one thing we wanted to mention for some of these general questions, you'll have another opportunity soon to have those addressed. We are hosting a CSE Alumni and Friends Virtual Town Hall coming up on Thursday, June 18th at 7 p.m. Central Time. 
you can register for that at z.umn.edu slash CSE Alumni Town Hall, and that will also be shared in the follow-up email as well. Um, a reminder, we'll be sending out a post-webinar email um, with a link of today's recording, and you're welcome to share that link with family, friends, colleagues, etc. cetera. Um, and it will also have a copy of other uh, links that may have been shared during today's session. Um, thank you so much to all of our presenters, and thank you all of you for uh, taking time out of your day to be with us today. Take care. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everybody.